Uh, welcome to our second talk in the Talks at 12 series, Pathways to Social Justice. My name is Elizabeth Day, and I'm Associate Director for Training and Policy Initiatives with the Braun from Brenner Center. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga Nation are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Cayuga Nation dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Cayuga Nation people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Thank you all again for joining us today, uh, both online and in person. If you have any questions and you're an online person, please put them in the chat. In person, obviously, you can just raise your hand when you have a question. We'll do questions at the end. We'll try to get, we'll try our best to get to all the questions. Um, and so I'll be reading the ones that are submitted online and just interspersing them with ones that we have in person. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Renata M. Leitao. Dr. Leitao is a Brazilian Canadian design researcher with 11 years of experience in collaborative projects with indigenous and marginalized communities. Dr. Leitao holds a PhD in environmental design and a master's of applied science and design and complexity. She launched as co-chair the DRS Pluriversal Design SIG, a research network that aims to highlight multiple perspectives in design, especially from those oppressed by and excluded from mainstream narratives. <clears throat> Recently, Dr. Leitao chaired the virtual conference Pivot 2021, Dismantling, Reassembling, Tools for Alternative Futures. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leitao. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much to the Bronfen Brenner Center for Translational Research for inviting me to, to present Reversal Design, Making Multiple Worlds Visible. So I work in the Department of Design and Environmental Analysis. It's going to change name in a few weeks. It's going to be Department of Human-Centered Human Design. But again, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement that the Cayuga Nation, they are the original owners and custodians of the lands on which we stand and work. So I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the many, many indigenous peoples that die every year defending their lands because it's still happening. So I just want to, to acknowledge their suffering too, as well. So, introducing myself, I always say that I'm Brazilian and Canadian. I was born in Brazil and I moved to Canada 14 years ago. And I, I don't think I would be the same person if I had stayed there. It was this contrast between global South and global North about the perspectives of the South and the perspectives of the North that shaped my, my career as a researcher. I am a graphic designer and I worked uh, as a graphic designer for several years before going to grad school. And I have to say there are very few graphic designers with PhD. It's very rare that uh, graphic designers design, uh, uh, start to, to, to do research. And as a researcher, my field is social design. Social design, uh, some people call it design for social innovation, design for social impact, uh, design for social needs of us. Let's call it uh, social design, the kind of design that creates interventions to address uh, social problems. My focus are the coloniality and social justice, because I think both uh, always, always go together. And I'm part of the cohort Pathways to Social Justice with my colleagues here. I'm so proud of being part of this group. Something I said, I'm, I'm born in Brazil and it's normal that Brazilians uh, are mixed race. So my parents had very distinct ethnic backgrounds. My mom was mixed of Polish immigrants 
with uh, Kaisara, that is a, a Miti people. My father is a mix of black and Brazilian Portuguese, that means enslaved and slavers. So I have the, all this different bloods and perspectives in me. And because my family lived in different parts of Brazil, when, my, when I moved from one side of my family to the other, it was a clash. So I had contact with different ways of thinking, different epistemologies since I was a child. And I could see that people don't understand the reality in the same way. People don't live in the same way. So I think that my family background made me a bridge person. So I was born in the south of Brazil, in Curitiba. There is a city famous for the urban planning. And at some point, my mom, looking for her roots, decided to, to do, take a sabbatical. And we moved to this island. It's a Kaisara community. And at that time, it was super isolated. No electricity, there is no TV, no cars, absolutely isolated. And being there, it was, a, 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 it was such an amazing experience to experience another kind of society, experience another organization uh, of community and other values. So I learned so much with them. I would never be the same person. So I worked for several years as a graphic designer before taking the decision to go to grad school. I studied at the University of Montreal in Canada. I studied, I did my master's and my PhD there. And my question was always how could graphic design or communication design contribute to social justice? Because many times I thought that, that graphic design is about creating branding logos, creating beautiful garbage, creating things to sell products. So that was my question. And I started to think that, no, okay, branding is identity. Graphic design is about communicating identity, but it's also about creating, constructing cultural identity. So creating a graphic design intervention, a project could also be about increasing the power of self-representation of misrepresented or invisible people. So I have always worked with participatory action research, co-creating projects in collaboration with indigenous communities. And it has always been marked by an interaction between local knowledge and academic knowledge. My PhD project, the name is Tapisquan, was a participatory action research project with the Tikamek Na Nation in Quebec. So the Tikamek Nation, the ancestral territory was this big area, Montreal, so we are probably somewhere here now, today. But now they live in those three tiny dots, the three reservations. And they are known among the other First Nations as Le Peuple de l'Ecosse, the people of the birch bark. Because they have a long tradition of engraving uh, birch bark and making canoes and baskets. And they used to have a semi-nomadic way of life until the 70s. So I think this is one of the, the last photos that we have of, of the, the winter camps before the sedentarization. So in the 70s, the Tikamek started to live in, in permanent bases in the three reservations. And of course, the reservations were not built to their lifestyle. The, the reservations were built with Western values. And until today, 
the reservations are not adapted to, to the traditional way of life, but they are also not adapted to, to the contemporary way of life. So we, they have so many problems in uh, that they are just, I, I won't even, even, even start to, 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 to talk about it, but what is amazing about, about the Tishkamek Nation is that they, cre they have created so many initiatives to, 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 to address their problems. So I have to say that it, they are a very creative nation. You have a project of, of filmmaking, the Wapikoni Mobile, that is super famous in Brazil that was created with the Tishkamek Nation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very creative people. So in 2010, they decided to do a, a partnership with the designers of the, the University of Montreal to address the challenge of producing crafts as an income source. And I have worked as a, as a research assistant of this project since the beginning. And what they told the team when they started the initial pro problems was that they have two main problems. One was loss of cultural identity because the crafts were becoming stereotyped. And second was the scarce supply of raw material because it was difficult to find moose hide or birch bark, like a, like a good like moose hide or birch bark. So they couldn't do their crafts anymore. And most of the interventions at the beginning with the design team was to look for alternative materials. My work there was to do what graphic designers do, like help to sell products. So create, I created the, the, the branding, the labels, uh, the identity. When I started my PhD after two years, working with that community, I realized something. And I made a proposition to, to the community. What if, okay, in the realm of craft, craftsmanship, Atikamek are the people of the birch bark. What if the core of their cultural identity was not the material, the birch bark itself, but the symbols engraved on it? I shared this proposition with uh, uh, Jacques Newashish and Christian Cucu. Jacques is a, like the most respected artist. Christian Cucu is kind of the minister of culture. And they thought it made a lot of sense, a lot of sense. So the foundations of my project was created in my conversations with them. It's a very complex project. So I, I try to, to show just a tiny part to simplify, but the reasoning is kind of this. I would see the baskets in the collection of the Council of Atikamek Nation in the museums, and I would see this kind of baskets, this kind of symbols. And then I would see contemporary visual communication, this. It was like, uh. And then just you I would see what is what are being produced as crafts today. Again, just they don't have the same symbols at all. So before contact, they built the cultural identity in relation to the peoples around them. They have been Aki, the Anishinaabe, the Inu. But after colonization, we have this split, white indigenous, white indigenous. So when you see this, they use symbols that identify indigenous people in general, like feathers, dream catchers, ego, like uh, all the, the things that identify indigenous people. But they are not using the symbols that identify themselves anymore. So the idea is that, the, yes, they think that the, the crafts are becoming stereotyped, but one of the reasons is that they 
didn't recognize that the symbols were meaningful forms of representation. With that idea, we created the Tapisquan workshops that is offered every summer for youth and established artisans. So the strategy of the workshops was developed since 2013. It's about just uh, linking like history, cultural heritage, identity with the creative process. So rediscover the graphic heritage and receive a design training. And since the beginning, I didn't want to be like, okay, designers arrived there. Yes, let's, let's teach you graphic design. So the mentors, like the most uh, like renowned artists of the Chicamec nation worked as mentors. So they were the translators of knowledge. We also have always, always started the, the, the workshops with uh, presentation, with classes from, from knowledge keepers, uh, explaining history, the meaning of the symbols, the history of representation. So we always start with the phases of cultural immersion. And many times people who don't have contact with indigenous people think that they are stuck in the past, but my experience is right the opposite because they live in a community, in a, in a reservation that was not built by them. They don't have uh, archives or museums. So many times they don't see the past of their culture. So before we start with cultural immersion and then we start the, the design training, we start to, 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 to introduce uh, silk screen, printmaking, the, like the, the, the design process. And it's always super fun to work together. And I think that the ultimate goal of engaged projects is when it proves to be so meaningful that the community embraces it. Today, I don't have contact with the project but Atikamek artists still deliver the workshops every summer. When I was working there, I realized something that I mean in Quebec, that projects with First Nations were marked by this dichotomy, settler white, the academics, the designers, and red First Nations community partners. So this is this was the, the dichotomy. What I brought in this project was the perspective from the South, uh, bringing not only my knowledge, but also knowledge of the communities that I had uh, interacted throughout my life. So I really believe that this other perspective helped the, the, the project a lot, really helped the, the discussions a lot. But I still didn't think that my perspective had place in the discourse around the project because it, it was still very marked by this dichotomy. Since I finished the PhD, I, th I think my main concern, interest, has been to decolonize design for social change. Something that I, that I name as pluriversal design. Why? Because I believe that design for change keep reproducing the Eurocentric model of society. This model of society, uh, the name is modernity. So what is this model? Western designers give, local communities receive. It doesn't matter. Before, uh, like in the 80s, uh, you, you have the discourse of designing for the other people. Now it's designing with the other people. Doesn't matter if it's for or if it's with. It's always designers create solution for the community that, that receives. And I really don't think that's possible to change something 
if we don't understand how, what we are trying to change, the impact of modernity on how we design. So first, if we want to talk about design for social change, we have to understand the legacy of colonialism. We have to understand how power asymmetries work. So, because if not, what are we trying to change? But most uh, social design methods, and the, the, the most famous is the design thinking from, from Stanford, only address the symptoms of social inequality, only create techno fixes for the symptoms. So when I think about decolonizing design for social change, it has two elements. The first one is decolonial, a critique of the Eurocentric worldview and its impacts on how we design. And the second is pluriversal, in the terms of recognizing and creating alternatives based on different ways of knowing and conceiving reality from the people who have been systematically marginalized and oppressed. And just a, an idea that when we talk, when we, I talk about the colonial thought, it's very present in the social sciences. So we have many different perspectives in many fields produced by scholars from Latin America, African, indigenous, many different perspectives. But there is something that they have in common is a recognition that the colonial structures of power are still active. They define labor, intercultural relationships, value, desirability, the vocabulary to describe society, knowledge production, etc. And they are at the root of most social inequalities. For me, how I understand colonialism, it had mainly three elements. This possession of lands, either for settlements, as in the case of the, the Cayuga Nation, or exploitation of natural resources. So we, we have several kinds of colonialism, settler colonialism and mercantile colonialism, but this possession of lands is a foundational element. Exploitation of people, it's super foundational. So, Slavery was the most extreme and violent form of uh, exploitation. But we still have migrant workers. We still have sweatshops. And the third element is the destruction of knowledge systems. When the Western epistemic canon became the only valid way to represent the world. And of course, I choose to address this uh, element because I'm a communication designer. So communication design is about representation of identity, but it's also about the representation of knowledge, how we share what you know, the form. So I have here a printed Bible from 1480. And believe, we haven't changed the form that much. Just, just the, 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 our journals still look much like that more than five centuries <laughs> after. So going back, the destruction of knowledge systems. There is a quote from Stuart Howe that I really like. Europe brought its own categories, languages, images, and ideas to the new world in order to describe it and represent it. It tried to fit the new world into existing conceptual frameworks classifying it according to its own norms and absorbing it into Western traditions of representation. So basically, societies became incapable of representing the world in their own terms. And even today, when they have to engage with people with power over their lives, be donors, policy makers, like government, they still have to use Euro Eurocentric terms. Another thing is that epistemic violence is something that, that just uh, I describe as the, the idea that the supposed 
superiority of Western knowledge has justified the exploitation of the others. So you have the division between human and subhuman. The human are civilized, the only source of knowledge in the subhuman is the terra nullius. It's extreme, but really the, the, the discussions at the beginning of the colonialism were exactly that. <laughs> so it's a long quotation, but, but I really like it. It's this one from Linda T. Huy Smith. One of the supposed characteristics of primitive peoples was that we could not use our minds or intellects. We could not invent things. We could not create institutions or history. We could not imagine, we could not produce anything of value. We did not know how to use land and other resources from the natural world. We did not practice the arts of civilization. By lacking such virtues, we disqualified ourselves, not just from civilization, but from humanity itself. In other words, we were not fully human. Some of us were not even considered as partially human. So this, division. And of course, there is no terra nullius, because here we're talking about many numerous different peoples. We, we have so many ways of being, so, so many systems of knowledge. We have so, so, so many concepts of reality. We have a lot. But we, is, uh, Boaventura Sousa Santos, describes as a abyssal lines. We have this abyssal line that after that line, after the limit of civilization, you don't see anything. It's like, like an abyss, nothing. Whatever is beyond the line, civilization don't see. And, and he names as north, north and south. But north and south for him is not geographic. Is south is a metaphor of suffering, of the suffering of colonized peoples. And the, he always says that on the other side of the light, there is a human treasury of knowledge, uh, so many infinite alternatives. There are wasted and not recognized. And sometimes when you say other forms of knowledge, I really want to stress that I'm meaning knowledge born in the struggle. Because many times when people think about indigenous knowledge, they think about those super idealized, uh, like ancestral knowledge from the ancestors, not what people learned surviving genocide, not people learned surviving slavery, not what people la learned with the everyday struggle. So this kind of knowledge, the knowledge born in the struggle, is usually the most invisible, the, the kind of knowledge that has absolutely no value. And I really think that we would never have social justice if this kind of knowledge continued to have no value. So another model is the idea né, that the, the center, the global north, is the template for humanity. is the template of what is good and desirable, what is valuable, the source of solutions and technology, with a mission to teach the periphery how to improve. And the margins of the coloniality are numerous different populations and cultures that are influenced by the center, of course, but they are striving to shape their own destiny. So if there is a term to, to, to describe the margins is self-determination. In the struggle for self-determination, the Zapatistas from Mexico, they created the idea of a world where many worlds fit. There is idea that differently from the Eurocentric world, there is a one world only, you will have a world where many worlds fit. Based on that idea, Arthur Escobar de developed a, a framework, the framework of the pluriverse. So for him, the pluriverse refers to the diversity of worlds, ontologies, and epistemologies that have been suppressed by coloniality. So we are talking about the worlds on the other side 
of the abyssal line. So when we talk about pluriversality, it's about breaking from this model and helping the different worlds to interact, to connect, to communicate with one another. And it's not something easy. Yeah, as I say that pluriversal design exactly aims to help with this interconnection. It aims to stimulate the ability to engage with diverse worldviews, epistemologies, and ontologies, to design alternatives that respect and nurture non-European defined ways of being and knowing. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all because there is a cognitive challenge because alternative epistemologies tend to seem unintelligible to people raised within modernity. And in part because we don't even have terms and categories to talk about different ways of being and knowing. When uh, people refer to different codes from, uh, of different societies, usually use terms as underserved, developing, disfranchised. And just think a little bit of how many assumptions, how charged those terms are with Western values. So I see that building intelligent bridges between distinct realities and epistemologies is the ultimate communication design problem. And it's also a translational research problem. And because we don't, cannot rely on vocabulary, on terms, this is something that we need to use image making and storytelling as tools for knowledge sharing and translation. So engaging with the pluriverse, what I plan to do, what I'm doing, I plan to do in the, the, the next few years. First is visualizing the structures of modernity. The second one, making south-north, north-south connections. And three, translations between indigenous and academic knowledge. So first one, visualizing the structures of modernity. Understanding how the assumptions of the Western culture filters the understanding of the others. So I always say that this, if this filter is unconscious, how can you want to understand the others? It all started with a paper that I wrote in 2018, this element, the myths of modernity, that I started to define this mindset, the colonial mind mindset in terms of the stories, characters, props. Characters as the Western hero, the dragon, the, the, pro the problems that we are always trying to, 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 to lay. The magician, the magician are the scientists and the designers, the children of the forest, that are those uh, fictional uh, indigenous people that don't exist anywhere. So that was the beginning of the case. Let's try to make this knowledge, this knowledge of the coloniality visible in a way that is accessible to many people. And to continue this, the, this, the, this project, I created a partnership with the Public Visualization Lab of Ocadian University in Toronto, where I used to work. So it's a lab of artists and designers. We received a, a Canadian grant to produce animations, illustrations, maps, models, videos for this project. So one example of something that we could do is to, to visualize what are the assumptions and theories of change behind terms such as underserved, empowerment, and opportunity? So whatever is needed to make those assumptions visible. So concept maps, illustrations, videos, stories, whatever is needed. The second element 
south north 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 south connections i have been developing with the pluriversal design special interest group the the plurisig that i founded with my dear friend leslie and noel so anyone it's an international network of designers and anyone think they can take part of our meetings and many people take, take part of our, our meetings but the goal is to highlight the work of designers and authors of color and from the global south and we have also created the pivot virtual conference the last one was this one uh, pivot 2021 dismantling reassembly anyone i said anyone can can participate and send uh, submit papers and we received more than 150 submissions so it was amazing amazing and it's very sad that we had to reject uh, half of them and just anyone can submit the submissions and participate but the keynotes were all people of color and from the global south in not only North America, we really try to diversify and, and bring people from several countries. So we had, for example, Dory Tonsdale, who is, who is American. We had Bayoko Molafi, who is Nigerian and lives in India. Have like Cambodian and Filipinas and uh, uh, to, to bring also in terms of Cambodia, the, the history from the genocide. We had Jason Lewis, who is an indigenous uh, scholar, and he works with artificial intelligence from based on indigenous epistemologists. We, and we had uh, Professor Arturo Escobar, of course. But the, the thing is, I, it's, it was also a communi communication design project. How can you make people that are so different to exchange, to make a connection in a meaningful way? So with the, the, the committee, with my team, we try to, we try to create a, a platform, some tools to connection. Finally, we decide, okay, we are going to use Zoom because people are used to Zoom, but we also created another platform on spatial chat to make people connect and mingle. So in between the, the, the presentation, we would go to, to, to spatial chat and we tried to design a very soft, a very uh, pleasant environment with like sounds of nature, water, birds, uh, where people feel, feel that they, they could really relax and talk. And also, I, I think that conference is, a, is a, an opportunity to make friends and to have fun also. Yeah. So, so I invited Brazilian musicians to play in the, like the, in the pause. So we also created this stage. And it was so nice because not only people would, 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 would watch the, the, the concert, but dance with the mouse. And they create like conga lines and have fun. And just, uh, and the feedback that I received was so positive that creating this uh, space for connecting with people was a game changer. The friendships that were, were formed that was, everything was, was a, such a nice, such a nice experience. So that's what I see, is what I mean with creating ways to share knowledge. And the third, the third element of engaging with the pluriverse is translation between indigenous and academic knowledge. That is going to be also a project of knowledge visualization. The first phase, in the first phase that is going to happen in the next year or so, it's a partnership with indigenous people from the Amazon forest. So either indigenous scholars who left their communities to learn the Western canon. So I specific, specifically thinking about, uh, I'm going to talk next week to a PhD student. 
So she learned, she started to learn Portuguese when she was already an adult, when she was already 18 years old. Or knowledge holders who often host Western scholars in their communities. So they are already used to make the translation between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge. So we are going to visualize why it is this translation that they have to, they have to do. So that's just uh, next year, starting to head to, to the Amazon forest. That's the, the, the next stage. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Um, in your uh, depiction of the pluriversal design, you had different circles of different sizes. Can you give us a little bit insight into how do you choose the size of the circles? If left to intuition, then there could be a lot of uh, subjective discussion around it. Yes, always uh, when you choose a representation, it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh opens to so to, to many discussions. When I chose the the the, the size of the circles was the, the size of the populations. That's that's what you have sometimes uh, societies that, that have only 50 people today and we have a society that have millions of people. So it was about to representing that there are different sizes but anyways we, uh, we are still talking about uh, huge diversity. Is this working? Yeah, I'm Sam. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. Uh, before asking my question, I did wanted to empathize with the personal narrative of being kind of an unintended bridge, uh, being a Latin American from Panama, land that survived the Spanish genocide and then brought in people from everywhere in the world to overwork them to build the real world in the canal. And that definitely affects the way I approach my work as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you your superficial thoughts and ideas on how to apply pluriversal design in two areas. One, uh, so-called science communication, which I prefer, prefer to call a, a social or cultural appropriation of science, thinking of uh, this idea of uh, two different epistemological systems that have to ethnologically and culturally collide to be able to exchange and in the second area would be in um, creating public policy. And I'm thinking particularly in the case of Spain, where I know that some political campaigns have actually like sold and promoted this idea of a plurinational state. Yes, plurinational. There are so many ideas of states that are based on like plurality, but they just, uh, the thing is, are the minorities really listen? So that's the that's the thing. And can they be listened? If we are we are always using those terms that are super Eurocentric. So how I see, see pluriversal design for me, it's just a, of creating kind of Rosetta stones, so of creating a, a communication devices that allow the translation, allow the 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 hidden knowledge to become visible or uh, allow the implicit assumptions to become visible. So we bring, so you bring that to the table. You bring things that are usually implicit or invisible to the table. That's how, how I see. Thank you, that was great. I'm interested in where could I go to see some of your visualizations of knowledge and assumptions? That's it. That's just the, 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 exactly the project that we are working with now. It's creating a, a website, a platform. So stay we have, tuned. Yeah, so yeah, stay tuned. Next year, it's going to be, to be <laughs> online. So that's what we are just uh, starting to choose the, the, the right uh, illustrators, the, 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 the right web designers, in the, in the sense, right? Because I think it's important that they are from different communities. 
So that's exactly what, what we, we are crea creating now. <laughs> Yes, it can be a <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. This was amazing. So what do you think about the idea of celebration? For example, Santos talks about these epistemologies being born in the struggle. But they don't want to be portrayed only as suffering and pain. And many of the people who produce these knowledges celebrate life and want to be seen as, as this, this kind of protesting, but through celebration and not through not through pain. Yes, absolutely. That, that's that's really important because we can't talk about the South without just understand recognizing the suffering. So just we do the land acknowledgement every time that we start here because we have to acknowledge that Cayuga nation suffers and is suffering because of that. So the suffering is acknowledged, but you cannot define people only by the suffering. That's the, 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 the thing. There are amazing things that they are creating. That, that's the purpose of showing so many strategies, so many just uh, social innovations that, that they are creating. So yes, the celebration is, is part of it. And as I said, just, just even with the, the conference, bringing people from my culture to play and then have the, 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 the just allow people to, to celebrate all the, the, the identities is a very important part. Another thing is trying to, to change how we frame, and I'm and I speaking as a designer, that, that's the thing. Usually when designers collaborate with, with communities, it's all, always framed around needs. But I really believe that we, you cannot address needs without understanding like the, 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 the aspirations, the desires, the positive, the light side of the community. Because if you are always focusing on the problems, you don't see the, the, the big picture. It's also important. Any other questions? Thanks so much for the, the talk. Um, I was curious in your visualizations, and maybe this is to be discussed and, and to be decided, um, but as a designer, one of your most important questions is who is your audience? I'd be curious who the intended audience for these visualizations might be. Yes, the, the intended audience are designers who work in like engage the projects. There are people who want to, to work in engaged projects, basically. That's the, that's the audience. And with time, when I, I created with Leslie the, the Plurisig, we thought that it would be like a tiny, tiny group, like a completely uh, marginal of the Design Research Society. But no, amazingly, just... Uh, Hundreds of people go to our meetings. So it's just, it's just like people who are interested in engaged projects, people who are engaged in like social design. But what I see is that designers in general are also interested in, in what we are creating. use of the term subhuman just kind of um, got me thinking that, you know, uh, the, the species that aren't human also have the same things happening to them. Their lands, they're dispossessed from their lands, uh -huh. the wildlife, they are exploited, um, and their knowledge systems are devalued. So I just think um, it just got me thinking, you know, imagining the world, um, you know, not only from other peoples, indigenous peoples, but also from the point of view of a whale or the point of view of a gorilla. Um, would uh, only benefit us as a species. I think the more we expand our circles, um, probably the better, <laughs> the better as a society we can be. So thank you for your good work, but um, subhuman, I would like to 
maybe think about that that means less than but rather than other ways of being that aren't human um maybe we need a new word for for that like not human but but not less than human it's more than human that is that's the the the, the famous exp, the, the expression now is more than human that's the, the non-human so, but what happens is some, that's something that I've thought a lot about it. Just, <laughs> it, it would be another presentation just about it. Is that when we started to talk about the pluriverse and the more than human, many people went from like Western Eurocentric notion about humanity, the humanity, the official humanity, directly to the more than human. So all the, the subhuman, the marginalized, they skip just no, so. Let's talk, let's think about plants and fungus and whales, but the peoples, the, the, like the, the superhuman, let, let's forget. So they forget. And it's very normal. I say, oh my God, listening to a fungus, it seems to be more, much easier than listening to, listening to marginalized people. So, <laughs> so it's something that... And I'm not being, and I'm not being, I, I'm, I, I'm super sarcastic as a, as a person, but I'm not being sarcastic because it's, it is more difficult. It is because the plant, the way you don't, don't answer back, don't contest you. <laughs> so that's why it is. Yes, but at the same time, you, uh, people can project on them so many different things. So I thought a lot about it. And I really think, of course, we now know that the world just, just uh, we have so many intelligent, really intelligent beings. So in a, just a indigenous epistemology, like the, the epistemology of my, my mother's family, we really believe that the world is alive and is intelligent. There is an, an intelligence in the environment, yes. I believe so. But what about listening to the people, to the epistemologies of the many people who have interacted with that intelligence? So then we will be much better uh, equipped to listen to the whales, talk to the, to the, the Maori people, they, uh, talk to the people from the Pacific Islands, how they interact with the, the whales for millennia how they listen to the whales from Medina. Because jumping from Western thought to, to, to talking to the whale, I think it's a little bit complicated. First, just learn with the people who have been interacting with the plants for, for, for like millennia. I think it's, it's very important. Hi, this is a fascinating concept. Um, I'm curious to see what you project as the greatest policy challenge or barrier to implementing the idea of the pluriverse or even just spreading this idea to broader circles within our nation and even cross-culturally in other sectors of society. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so, it's just, I think it's so, so out there that I just what, everything that we can do is like enhance the signal, uh, reach more people, show more people. It's like teaching another language, teaching another language to communicate. And with the hope that in like 20 years, we, enough people will be able to, to speak that language so we can then influence like policymakers. I think so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.